Right, it's ten past six, and we'll make a start. Um, welcome to the event, guys. Um, so if most of you are newly qualified, um, and I've had so many questions over the last uh, few couple, week or so that I've just, we decided it was probably best to do a webinar and go through some of the key issues around uh, new, about working as a locum or going as an employed pharmacist. Um, and a lot of the questions are very, very similar. So we put a panel together um, today to, of experienced pharmacists who can guide you through a lot of the issues. So first of all, we've got Paul Summerfield on the left. Uh, you can see on there. Um, he's a pharmacist. Um, he's a local pharmacist and a solicitor as well. Sorry. Can I just lawyer. stop? Yeah. Barrister, thank you. Barrister, 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 yes. Um, uh, with Siddiqui Rahman as well, he's a GP uh practice pharmacist we've got Sija who is a hospital pharmacist and we've got another we've got uh, Anisha joining us later on uh, she's also a hospital pharmacist um, and because we've had so many questions around accountancy company formation we've invited one of our approved uh, accountancy firms Centric Consultants so we've got Imran there as well and he'll be able to answer a lot of your questions about whether to open up as a limited company sole trader what the differences are IR35 as well, and a lot of the companies have now said locums are no longer going to teach it within IR35. Uh, but a few companies are kind of dodging that in a really different way. So Imran will go through all of that with you um, and just discuss uh, which way to set up your companies. So first of all, um, just wanted to tell you guys about the Pharmacist Cooperative and who we are and what we do. Uh, just a bit of a history, we set up in 2016 as a support network on WhatsApp, um, mainly for locums because locums were really getting a bad deal uh, back then and mostly the representation that we have is very little. So the, so the aim was to have everyone onto one single network and where we could discuss our issues um, and learn from each other. Uh, and support each other as well. That grew quite rapidly, and then we moved over to Telegram in the end of December uh, 2016, early 2017, we started moving everyone over. And now we have a huge network of around 10,000 pharmacists, um, and that ranges from regional and local groups that go from Scotland, um, rest of England, Wales. So even in England, we have sub subgroups as well, uh, regional groups of Northwest, uh, Northeast, uh, Midlands and then London and South, um, and these yeah, you'll see a lot of. Right, could you mute your audio, please? Okay, uh, yeah. So we have the regional groups. So if you need to look for work, we've got a lot of them, a lot of shifts are being posted on those regional groups as well. We also have a clinical support group. So uh, if you have any questions, any clinical questions, uh, you can always ask on the clinical support group. And there's about four and a half thousand pharmacists on there. So some will be able to answer your questions. The pharmacy lounge is more for your general discussion um, and anything to do with pharmacy, professional issues, uh, you can discuss on the uh, pharmacy lounge. And then we have the separate uh, professional network. So. It's £30 a year to join uh, as a professional member with the Pharmacy Cooperative. Um, and as a member, you get discount on uh, processing services that we offer. Uh, you get first access to all the shifts that are posted on our network. Uh, but more importantly, it supports the work that we do. Um, we have a big admin team. Um, we do a lot of the lobbying work behind the scene. We have a legal uh, team that we kind of reach out to if you have a need any kind of work doing or any kind of legal questions. So all that costs a lot of money. So I would suggest, I just want to suggest joining uh, as a professional member to get the extra benefit, but also to support and help us continue the work that we do. Um, and also later, uh, once uh, everyone's finished talking, we will open up the floor to any kind of questions that you have. So if you do have any questions, can you please post them on the general message uh, on Zoom and then we'll go through them and we'll try and get through all of your questions. Uh, it, it is an hour long, but we can probably extend a little bit if, uh, if there's a lot of questions to go through. 
Now, just to give you some background, I'm, I am a pharmacist myself, uh, a local pharmacist. I've been qualified 2005, um, and I spent my very first day after qualifying was an emergency locum shift in a very busy branch. Now, a lot of the questions I had was people getting stressed and worried about locuming on the first shift or on the first few weeks, you know, what are they going to deal with? To be honest, it's no different from what you were doing as a pre-reg, except now you're in charge. But as a pre-reg, you were also partially responsible for the work that you did. Uh, but now you are fully responsible for the full team. Things won't really change much as a qualified pharmacist on your first day. You still have a full team of qualified staff, hopefully, uh, wherever you work. There'll be SOPs, so the staff should know exactly what to do. Um, and I think the only difference is that you sign on as a registered responsible pharmacist and you have your name up on the wall as the responsible pharmacist and to ensure that anything that everything that goes through that you are aware of. Now, there's some legal issues, uh, questions that you need to, you may have, um, and some things that you need to be aware of. And Paul will go through those with you afterwards. Um, from my own experience, what I would say is, um, I know a lot of, and this is a common question I get, should, should you go employed or should you go low coming? I would say go with low coming first. It gives you a lot of experience in working at different companies, uh, looking at the company culture, looking at the how the branches work, how the systems and processes work. And once you've got that experience of working in a large number of different pharmacies and with different systems and different people, you get a good understanding of what your strengths and weaknesses are. So when you go into uh, a management or employed uh, role, you've got that vast experience that you bring with you. A lot of people say that, you know, as a locum, you don't really, you can't really put that on your CV. And I think that's where a lot of people misunderstand how much knowledge and experience a locum can bring uh, to the table. And there's so much that you can put down uh, through your work at different companies and you can bring the best of those companies to wherever you uh, take your job as, a, uh, as an employed pharmacist. And when I did my brief since as a manager for a couple of companies, that's really what helped me because I, I could see what other companies did uh, really well and I could bring that to my branch and help uh, make my branch a success. So that would be my personal advice, uh, that locum first and then go into management. Don't dive head in into management and then try and figure out you know, how to do things differently or where things are going wrong because unless you really have a lot of support and experience from other people that you can uh, speak to, it's probably best to learn from other areas first. Um, I'm going to bring on Paul, Paul Summerfield, um, and he will discuss a bit more about his experience as a local pharmacist plus uh, the legal side of things. So over to you, Paul. Hi, everybody. And uh, again, just to um, echo Tordell's um, Welcoming, welcome to this um, webinar, and please do join the Pharmacist Cooperative. It's less than a pound a week, and you'll be supporting a lot of the good work that um, the team do, to be honest. Right, a little bit of background about myself. I qualified in 97 as a pharmacist, and I've been a locum ever since. I've held various roles since then. Um, I've been a superintendent pharmacist, I've been a legal advisor, I've been a surgery, a GP surgery pharmacist, um, but throughout the background, I've always been a locum pharmacist, and currently, uh, a locum pharmacist, I'm also a visiting lecturer at Reading University um, for the independent prescribing course, and I, am also, I also have my own company who uh, represents pharmacists, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about me being a pharmacist. Right, so I still remember my first shift back in 1997. It was 28th of July when I qualified, and I still remember it to this day. Um, scary wasn't the word to describe it. As Toro said, yes, I was, a, you know, same as being a pre-reg, but the buck stops with me. And, you know, it's, it's quite a scary feeling. And, you know, a vast majority of you would have done your first shift as a qualified pharmacist. So I'm sure you can think about that and think about how potentially terrifying it was. The reason that I 
chose to locum and stayed as a locum is the flexibility. Um, the flexibility is amazing. You're not tied to an employment contract. You can choose who you work for, when you work, what holidays to take, when to take them. But also, if you want to do other things, you can, you can divide your time up as well. Now, a lot of individuals, especially in the companies, will think, oh, it's a locum. He can't or she can't get a job. That's why they're a locum. Well, that's not true. It's more of a choice than being able to, to not, not be employed. And it's the flexibility which, I, which really appealed and still appeals to me as a, as a locum pharmacist. Um, there are tax advantages as well, and I'm sure um, our friends at Central will go through that later on um, in relation to sort of how to set up a, you know, a different legal structure depending on um, your tax advantages and how you want to work. But I enjoy being a locum pharmacist. I still predominantly work as a locum 40 to 50 hours a week. I do the legal stuff on the side. I do the lecturing stuff on the side. But when I'm needed, I'll take a day or two off to do that thing. And that's the wonderful thing of being a locum. You can do that. And remember, as a locum pharmacist, you are still the pharmacist. You are still the responsible pharmacist. The buck stops with you. But also what you should be remembering as well is that your decisions as the RP should be upheld and should be supported by the people who you're working with. Sometimes locums get a lot of bad, a lot of a bad reputation. Oh, they didn't do this, they didn't do that. I myself am currently got several really good rumors going around about me and um, about how I refuse to do services, which is, to be honest, a load of tosh. And the company I'm working for at the moment knows a load of tosh as well. Um, but locums do get a bad reputation. Um, as long as you go in there, you do your job, you do the job to the best of your ability, you'll be absolutely fine. Nothing can be said against you or against what you've done. And the Francis Cooperative Network, they're there to support you. The Telegram groups are, it's almost instant support that you'll get. It may not be immediate, but it will be you know, within a matter of minutes, somebody will be there to help you. So please do use the network, either as the free group, but preferably, preferably Oops, oops. In, yeah. in order to be able to do that. Okay, so you'll get the you'll get the support that you need. But I'm going slightly off topic. I'm going back onto TPC here. And, and you know, yes, it's about looking at the network and how we can support you. Right, sorry, somebody muted me there. <laughs> Don't know whether there was any feedback online, but anyway. Going back, use the network, whether it's three or the paid group, preferably the paid groups. A lot of the times when you're a locum pharmacist, you'll be put out of your comfort zone. You'll be asked to make decisions and you'll be expected to make them fairly quickly. It's not about how fast you are, which puts you in, uh, into a sort of, you know, a league of your own. It's not about how many services you provide. It's not about working through and not taking a break and ripping your shirt open and having Superman or Superwoman underneath your shirt. It's not all about that. It's about providing the most effective and safe clinical service that you can remember, irrespective of, of what you do in the pharmacy world, whether you're an employee, whether you're a locum, whether you work in community, whether you work in hospital in GP surgery, you are providing a clinical service in a clinical environment. It needs to be safe, it needs to be effective. So if you need to take your time to do that, then you take your time. You have to be comfortable with the decision that you make at the end of the day. So if you need five, 10 minutes, you need five to 10 minutes. Don't be pressurized by somebody shouting at you from the other end of the counter. This patient wants to see you now. They've been waiting five minutes. Tough. Let them wait five minutes. If, you, if you're doing something which requires your attention, you don't divert from that. You will feel under pressure at times. 
Um, and you may feel you'll come out of some places and you'll think, I never want to go back into there again. Or you'll come out of some places and think, yeah, that was pretty good. Or you'll come out and you'll go home, you'll sit down. Next thing you know, you fall asleep in front of the TV and it's time to go to bed. That's to be expected. Okay, pharmacy is a very, very difficult environment to work in. You've got a lot of calls on your time. You've also got a lot of pressure um, from the mental element of being a pharmacist. I was speaking to a dispenser um, just a few days back, and they split the time between the pharmacy and the shop floor. And they say every time they come to the pharmacy, they go home absolutely tired because it's a different skill set they're using. Now, we're providing clinical services. You, you know, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna find that you are tired. You need to take a step back. So if you need to go for a break, go for a break. The GPHC will expect you to handle your workload appropriately, irrespective of whether you've been on for one day, one month, one year, 10 years. They will expect you to make the decision when, as and when you need breaks. So you take breaks as and when you need them. Don't be pressurized into either not having a break or having a short break. And a tip from me, if you're given an hour for your lunch, take yourself off the premises, keep your mobile phone on, but take yourself off the premises. Don't let you be bullied or pressurized into, oh, can you just stay on the premises? And if you don't mind, we'll come and see you. And, and can you check this? And oh, patient is once a word, it'll only take two minutes. Don't do any of that. If you take an hour, go out. Get yourself out, even if it's half an hour, get yourself out. You need that time to recharge. Uh, as I say, I find locoming for me, it's very, very, you know, it appeals to me. It's a career choice that I've made. I've been doing it for 24 years. I can count on one hand how many times I've had to take a break away from locoming because there was no work. That's how um, buoyant the market is. So you'll hear a lot of people saying, oh, you know, there's going to be no need for locums in five, 10 years. I heard this when I first qualified in 97, and I'm still a locum pharmacist. I'm still around. You know, there's, there's no issue being a locum. You're not a second-class pharmacist. You are a first-class pharmacist. You're delivering a first-class clinical, clinical service, but on an employment term, you're doing it on your own terms. So you know, go out and this tutorial will say, go and locum. Find what you want. If you want to be employed later on, brilliant. If employment suits you from the first day, brilliant. That's your choice. You need to do what makes you feel comfortable. Thank you, Toro. Thanks, Paul, for your um, wisdom um, and all your uh, help. Uh, Paul is actually one of, uh, is quite active on the network, um, and I, he does help with a lot of the clinical questions and a lot of the uh, legal stuff. So you can catch up with Paul um, on our network. Next, we have Mohamed Siddiqui Rahman. Now he's uh, got a lot of experience in GP practice. Um, so Mohamed, can you tell us a bit more about what you do and how pharmacists can go into uh, GP land? Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Siddiqui Rahman. Uh, I'm a uh, part of the directors of the Pharmacist Cooperative, uh, as well as my day job being a full-time general practice pharmacist prescriber and also being a, a PDA union rep uh, for primary care in the southeast region. Um, I'm sort of trying to be concise, first of all, because that's quite a lot for to talk through, because I'll be talking one about uh, what it's like working in general practice and also uh, why it's important uh, for pharmacists, especially newly qualified pharmacists, to join a union. Now, before I begin, uh, I just want to say... Uh, thank you all for attending for this evening's webinar, uh, especially on a Saturday evening. And especially for those newly qualified, uh, I've there have been a, a recent uh, pre-reg and especially the post uh for the last uh, eight, nine months um, to be um, working and studying and also uh, getting through the registration exams in this uh, global pandemic during these trying times has been nothing short of uh, uh, exceptional. So um, well, kudos to everyone uh, that have passed the uh, recent exams and hopefully there's uh, some of the works going to partake during the summer as well and, and they get through them as well. Um, so one of the questions um, I'm being asked about uh, working in general practice 
And that is a myth that I hear from time and time again, is that you need to be a prescriber to get into general practice. Um, it's, it, it's definitely is not the case. Uh, I mean, it's definitely desirable, but it's not essential. And I, I would say uh, most of the tasks and activities that I do in general practice, I'd probably say 80%, 80 to 90%, I don't use my prescribing qualifications. So, so, so what do I do? So I think um, to begin, I'll probably just give a bit of a background of um, how I got into general practice, just to uh, give you ideas about um, how you can start to apply into general practices, uh, especially what, coming from a community pharmacy background like myself. Um, I mean, I've had a, a wonderful and widespread experience working uh, as a community pharmacist uh, for the past 10 years. Initially as a relief pharmacist for a major multiple, uh, then as a store-based pharmacy manager, and then uh, eventually um, uh, becoming a, a full-time locum pharmacist, uh, as Paul was talking about earlier. Um, I've locum that all the various multiple supermarkets, independent chains, as well as working um, as a community pharmacist locum in various settings in railway stations, airports, private nursing care homes. Uh, although I've enjoyed working in the community and retail settings and enjoyed the buzz of leading my team of farm staff members, and I still do, uh, miss that actually. Um, I do do the, um, uh, the odd few local community pharmacy uh, work uh, during the weekends or during my, my holidays, just so I'm, I'm up to date and, and keep up to date uh, with all things that's current. Uh, in community pharmacy, but um, I wanted to uh, also have the opportunity to utilize and expand my uh, therapeutic and pharmacological knowledge and experience working in a multidisciplinary clinic setting to make a direct impact to improve patients' healthcare outcomes uh, and also make key lifestyle interventions uh, within my scope of practice. Um, one of the key differences in terms of working in community pharmacy and working in general practice is that uh, in um, general practice, you have full access to um, patients' medical records. And that is significant because um, uh, you're able to see what type of um, medical problems they have, uh, even at the early stages. Um, you have full uh, view of their clinic and hospital letters, including discharge letters, as well as having access to the, the recent pathology blood test results, which is going to be important in terms of dictating what the next set of treatment is going to be like. Um, in terms of getting into general practice, um, beforehand I've attended and self-funded uh, many training courses related to general practice and clinical knowledge as well. I've also work shadowed uh, with an experienced practice-based uh, pharmacist, uh, working in, in multiple general practices around the UK and in my own time as well um, as a locum and realised that this was an area that I wanted to work. But at the same time, um, I also realised that I um, also needed to update my clinical knowledge, as well as being vigilant of the latest clinical changes that are constantly changing at such a fast pace at the time. I think the other question I also get asked is, um, is it worth doing a clinical diploma to get into general practice? And again, I'll give the same answer uh, as I would before um, when it comes to prescribing. It's desirable, but it's not essential. And with the clinical diploma especially, um, the minute you finish completing a course, that qualification goes out of date because these clinical guidelines have changed at such a fast pace. And even just last week, we've had the new nice guidelines on pain management, where they're now encouraging using of SSRIs, antidepressants, rather than um, uh, the usual analgesics, even paracetamol. And also um, the uh, nice guidelines for AF, they changed in terms of the bleeding risk scoring tools where it used to be used has bled, but now they use um, orbit. And, and there's a few of these clinical um, areas that uh, they do get changed and you need to be keeping it up to date um, in all the um, uh, uh, guidelines as well. Now, when NHS England announced that they will be funding the first 490 clinical farms in the country to work in general practices, uh, especially in view of national shortage of GPs, um, I've jumped at the unique opportunity uh, and really prepared myself for the role and uh, successfully acquired this. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the main obstacle I assumed was that I was not an endemic prescriber and that would hold me back. But I quickly realised that this was, uh, again, only a tool uh, to, to meet the ends. Um, and uh, as most of my uh, time working in uh, a general practice, 
Um, I use my pharmacological and clinical skills for a wide variety of tasks, such as medication reviews, structured medication reviews, audits, action, uh, the MHRA drug alerts, monitoring high-risk drug uh, risk uh, medications, conducting uh, chronic condition review clinics, uh, such as, and, and the four um, clinics uh, that you should be focusing on in general practice, especially uh, hypertension, asthma, COPD, and diabetes. I also deliver training sessions to other healthcare professionals and with the non-clinical staff, uh, administer the influenza and now the COVID-19 vaccinations, uh, and much, much more. Now, when working in the general practice sector, the job doesn't finish at your typical nine-to-five role, as you have to be clinical up-to-date uh, for any new drug changes and emer- new emerging drug trials that are coming through at such a regular, fast pace, and keeping yourself up-to-date with the local and national guidelines and to be able to study these in your own time as well, because you're not going to have time to do that uh, when you are uh, working in general practice. Um, you find sometimes when you're working in community pharmacy, even though you might be checking 800 items or 1,000 items per day, um, the, the time doesn't move as fast and, uh, and you're more, more physically active. Whereas in general practice, even though you're, you're not spending that many patients compared to you as you would in terms of uh, prescriptions, there's a lot that you need to go through as well, and you can suddenly see time just flies when you're uh, looking at the patient, not just the medication, but also their condition and, and looking at, um, at the patient holistically. Um, I would say attending conferences uh, is a must uh, when you're working in general practice, uh, such as the, the pharmacy show and, and my favourite, the Clinical Pharmacy Congress. And I think nowadays, uh, due to the pandemic, it is now uh, online, so you could... Um, access it um, virtually as well. Um, uh, you can also build up your CPD and revalidation portfolio uh, and as well as attending separate GP and nurse-led training courses privately rather than just um, uh, pharmacist-led uh, uh, courses. Now at the Pharmacist Cooperative, uh, uh, we're going to announce that um, uh, we're partnering up with a GP pharmacist training programme and again, those pharmacists who are keen to work in the general practice, uh, watch this space and it will be um, news may be made available on our pharmacy corporate net- networks. Uh, so you'll be able to have access and also a discount for the future training as well. The one thing I would recommend pharmacists to do uh, in, in order to keep the clinical knowledge up to date is to sign up for the NICE Daily Medicines Awareness Service. Again, I will put that link up uh, in the chat box there in a minute as well. Um, I've also written a few articles about working in general practices, uh, with the most recent one being the top 10 tips working in PCNs and general practices. Again, they are all available in the Pharmacist Cooperative Network, and, and again, I will post a link up as well. Now, just a bit quickly about joining a union, and again, it's something that all pharmacists, not just newly qualified, um, uh, should consider joining. Now, uh, what is a union? A union is where they defend their members when they're faced with a conflict and they challenge employers, regulators and government on behalf of their members. They are able to accompany members to the discipline meetings with employers in the event of a dispute and with their professional regulatory bodies. Um, they also provide insurance cover to safeguard and defend the members' reputation and proactively lobby the individual members' agenda. Uh, also, uh, uh, declaration of interest, I am a PDA union rep, uh, so and you, as you may know, as a newly qualified, they have uh, taken great steps to help uh, defend and uh, promote the well-being of the provisional uh, registrants. Um, now, why joining union? Uh, it's because where the union has a majority of pharmacists in membership, such as the PDA union, there is an individual membership and greater influence. And where the union has greater uh, recognition, uh, as um, there are in Boots, Lloyds, and certain hospital trusts with the PDA, there is more chance uh, to influence an opportunity to represent members on the professional and clinical problems of work, but also to negotiate on their workplace conditions, uh, improve salary and payments, health and safety, and equality matters. So for everyone, if you can, uh, to, to join a union, any union, and uh, you can um, 
uh, have a look in that uh, through the chat box, which I will send through the references. Thank you. And if you've got any questions, again, about uh, the work I do in uh, general practices, you can find me on my Twitter handle at GP Pharmacid and also on Telegram. Thank you all. Thanks, Sudoku. That was really insightful. Um, we will put everyone's Twitter handles on uh, on our website when we upload this video. So um, anything that you miss, you can catch up afterwards or you can get, rid of, get in touch with anyone on Twitter or even on Telegram. We're, we're all as on there. So you can get in touch with us as well. Um, we've got next uh, Sija and Anisha. They'll be talking about hospital pharmacy and what it's like to work in hospital and how you can make that cross if you want to. Um, so over to you guys. Hello, um, this is Seja. Um, I am a, a clinical pharmacist at Pennine Care in Northwest. Um, in Northwest, um, I'm a mental health specialist, so I work. I work in the mental health um, sector. Um, I qualified as a pharmacist in 2017. Was on the register 2017 December. Um, I started off as a community uh, locum pharmacist. So for anyone out there who is a um, working in a community pharmacy or doing the pre-region community pharmacy, uh, just keep in mind it is possible for you to actually to go inside the hospital. Um, I did locum for a year and a bit. Uh, and then I did apply for the hospital. I did get loads of um, rejections. But then at the end, once I got the acceptance, I got the acceptance, which was great. Um, with my daily job, I started off as acute. Right now I'm doing home treatment team, so I'll explain the difference. So as a acute um, hospital mental health pharmacist, what you do is you work very closely with the patient, with the nurses and with the consultants. Um, and usually what you do is you go from more toward checking the charts, seeing whether whatever the consultant has prescribed is appropriate for the patient, seeing whether they have prescribed um, something that's not over the BNF max, uh, making sure they've done the bloods, um, checking um, the um, blood pressure as well, because some of the mental health um, tablets do cause that. Um, any issues we do, well, as a mental health pharmacist, you do have to sit and talk with a consultant. It's straight the consultant. It's not like the general acute where you've got junior doctors around and you can just talk to them. No, it's straight to the consultant. Um, at first, I used to find it intimidating, uh, but over time, as soon as you build your confidence, you're able to tackle it when you know something is wrong, something doesn't look right, and you just have to make sure that the consultant understands. It helps having evidence of where you've researched, where you've got everything from. So also anyone who is planning to go into mental health, um, can you please keep in mind that it's not like the general acute because you will get patients that will throw water at you, chase you around. I've had all of that. Um, but just to keep in mind, they are mentally unwell and um, there are nurses there to save your day. So um, I've had those kind of days. Um, but it's, it's a very specialised niche. So you have to keep in mind, you have to always try to um, keep reading about the mental health, new medications always coming out, um, keeping up to date with it. Um, sometimes it's a bit hard to do the reading because um, with mental health, it's more of a gray area rather than it being black and white. Um, every consultant has their favorite drug to prescribe. Uh, some consultants do things the old way, not the new way. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, I worked as a Q, um mental health pharmacist for a year and a bit. And then I moved on to the outpatient as a home treatment um, pharmacist. Um, I work at Pennine Care at the moment. Um, it is a very, it's a very new role. And what we what we are doing at the moment is making this role our role. So at the moment, it is a bit hard trying to 
work in a sense of trying to make the role yours because there isn't a men- mental health pharmacist home treatment team in Pennine Care. Um, so that's the difficult part. Um, at the moment, it's loads of SOPs, reading loads of F- SOPs, creating SOPs, procedures, doing lots of training for staff members, trying to make uh, the medicine management aspect of the home treatment much more safer. As a home treatment team pharmacist in the mental health sector, you tend to go on home visits as well. Um, if you've got your prescribing course, then you tend to prescribe as well for, for uh, patients. At the moment, I don't have it, so I don't do that part. They do offer you um, to expand your knowledge. So I have done a um, a um, certificate in sci- uh, sci- uh, therapeutic and psychiatry, which is quite um, quite um, interesting. Um, Sorry, guys, if you, I don't know whether everyone can hear me properly, if there is an echo or not. I've got no idea, but I'm just hoping everyone can hear me properly. No, um, you're fine. There's an echo. Okay, that's fine. Um, and then um, that was quite interesting. Um, just waiting for the results, to be honest. Uh, and then after that, there is a psychiatry diploma where you do more of the therapeutics just to understand it in a more in-depth uh, way. They do tend to help you as much as possible in the mental health sector. Um, there is no, anyone can actually get into it. Anyone that thinks they can't, you can. I just wished that I went into the general um, wards instead and did most of uh the um yes sorry it is the Aston one that does the certificate yes it is that one um I do wish I went on to the general wards just to increase my clinical knowledge in that sense of the general aspect rather than just going straight into something specialized because it can be hard at times when you do get um questions about um if patients got heart issues or anything other than that, it can be a bit difficult because you haven't been much exposed to that. So you just go back to the nice guidelines. Obviously, if a patients that do have more of heart issues, we do try to refer them to specialists because obviously we are a specialized in mental health. So we don't tend to play around with things that aren't within our um, niche. Uh, but yeah, um, it's a very interesting um, job role. So I would advise for anyone who wants to go into something very specialised, but anyone who doesn't, I would um, say try try something else that you're passionate about. But yeah, anyone out there who's a community pharmacist, you definitely can come in. And it's all just hard work and they are quite nice in the hospital. Um, they do tend to take in community pharmacies because we have a different sort of set of skills that we can offer to them. And I've used that many times. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. it pretty, pretty much it. Uh, thank you, Toidil, and to, to you. Uh, thanks. Uh, CJ, that was really useful. Um, and also, uh, Anisha, you're a hospital pharmacist and you've got a lot of experience in the COVID side. Tell us a bit more about how you got into hospital and um, how they okay. the pharmacists can go into it as well. So um, I did my pre-reg predom- um, in hospital, but I did a uh, cross-sector in community just to figure out what it was about. Uh, once I qualified, I went straight into locuming and I can't recommend locuming more because you get to experience everything from any sector that you wish to go in any specialty and you're needed everywhere because the NHS is chronically understaffed um so when I first qualified I went straight into prison pharmacy and I was locuming in community on the side and then I went into hospital I started off as an acute care pharmacist so I was doing A&E and the acute admissions wards then started specialising a bit. So I went into psych, I went into um, maximum security psych, uh, forensics, uh, care of the elderly, stroke, rehab units. I've worked in a couple of rehab units. Um, what else? Gastro. You name it, I've probably <laughs> worked in it because that's the beauty of locuming. Um, like I said, it's best to start off your career as a locum just because you're fresh and new to the game. You've got all these ideas and you're young and you you could pick up things much easier so you can just 
jump from specialty to specialty, site to site, sector to sector, and figure out what you enjoy, which is what I did. I kind of worked in community prim- um, hospital, outpatient departments, prisons, um, specialised units, eye hospitals, private public everything and just kind of morphed all my knowledge into one and tried to everywhere I learned something I would take it over to the next site and try and bring in my ideas and it makes you indispensable to them because you're bringing in new thoughts and new ways of working which kind of makes you an asset to any place you go to and that will kind of help you figure out what you want to do in the future if you 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 don't have to be set on it but that again like Paul said earlier is the beauty of locoming you're not tied down with a contract you're not tied to one site you can move and do whatever role you want um but with hospital pharmacy you kind of get booked in blocks so it'll be like a three month or a six month stint they say up to like six months but places have asked to keep me for three years um it's it's great and just it's a great experience and you get to learn a lot and the beauty, another beauty of hospital pharmacy is you're not alone. In community pharmacy, you're there, you're like the front person, you're going to make the decisions. You, A patient comes up to you and asks you a question, you can't just run around the other side of the hospital and find someone to give you the answer. But um, in a hospital, you can literally turn around, you have a, a massive team around you. Um, how long can we... Um, yeah, you have a massive team around you. In terms of how to get into hospital locoming, you have to sign up to agencies. You can't uh, just approach them and do it how you do in community where you can just contact the pharmacy and work with them directly. You have to do the competency training. So you have to do uh, basic life support, sometimes advanced life support, uh, adult safeguarding, child safeguarding, um, all of those competencies, which you would do through a company and they would pay for it. And then um, that you will have an agent assigned to you and they will find you jobs. Um, You have every right to demand what area you work in, what kind of sector you work in, your rate, the distance you travel, all of those things, you dictate it. But what I would suggest at the start is kind of be a bit loose and willing to work anywhere until you pick up more experience. And then you can start honing in on sites and honing in on areas and saying, I'm not going to travel outside the M25 or um, I want a max, a minimum of £28 an hour. Um, and it's a great way to jump through banding. So I went straight into a band seven and now I'm a band eight. I'm working in a community hospital. Um, it's a community hospital and a mental health hospital. Um, so I'm learning a lot and it's just good. I also got redeployed to the Nightingale Hospital when they opened up for the second time. Um, as a clinical lead so locums because you're you're very flexible they they rely on you a lot and they will move you and give you a lot of opportunities to work in a lot of different sites um that's it that's all I can think of thanks Anisha uh yep that's great. Uh, we have got quite a few questions about hospital. I'm just making a list of them. Um, what I'll do is I'll invite Imran to talk a bit more about the accountancy side. Um, and then once he's finished, we'll open up the floor to uh, all the questions and we'll try and list the questions that we're, we're kind of getting on the chat and go through those questions. Um, so Imran, can you... Imran from Central Consultant. So he's um, the that's an accountancy firm that's on our list of approved um, firms. Now we had a lot of questions from um, locums about setting up a limited or a sole trader, what the difference is, um, and obviously who the best accountancy firms are. So a few couple of years ago, we decided to go out and talk to a few accountancy firms, uh, negotiate a rate that's reasonable for the work they do um and they provide a very good service uh and centra has one of the best um feedbacks we've had on all the of all the uh, firms so far uh so i want to invite imran today invite imran over to ask uh, to answer some of those questions that we've had and if you need to ask any further questions he will be available tomorrow to uh answer more of your questions um and go through anything in further detail so imran can you Tell us a bit more about the um, the difference between sole trader and um, limited company and 
which one is better to go for um, for uh, for newly qualified pharmacists? Yeah, sure. So for a limited company, um, it's uh, for a local pharmacist. It pretty much always works out to be better as long as you're doing it um, as your main income. So you're not you're not employed by anybody else. So you've not got a payroll with Boots or Lloyd's or anybody else. It always works out better to be uh, a limited company um, when you're doing it full time, um, just because of the deductions that you can do um, for to make your tax return. Like it ends up being basically about half of what it would be as a sole trader. For a sole trader, you basically it's just not much different to just being employed. The tax rate is the exact same, and you only have a few deductions that you can do, which is your GPC membership, your indemnity insurance. There's not that much you can claim as a sole trader, because essentially as a sole trader, you're just working for yourself. So you haven't, you, you're, you're limited in how many things you can make to reduce your tax. So, you know, if you were making 40,000 pounds working as an employee for Boots, for example, you would pay around about five and a half thousand in tax, uh, um, three and a half thousand in national insurance and about 1,100 in uh, your sole trader. So you're looking at about 10, 11,000 pounds in tax paid in a year on a 40k salary if you're working for Boots. If you did that as a sole trader, it'd only go down to about £10,000. You're still paying £10,000 in tax. Whereas if you did that through a limited company, you'd be paying uh, under £5,000. So you're saving £5,000 by just working for yourself. And uh, and that's just based on £40,000. Like the average locum earns at least £47,000. Uh, most of our locums that we have are on between fifty and £70,000. So they're, they're saving even more because if they did that for employment, you know, they'd be paying uh, a lot more in tax. Sorry, I'll, um, okay, that's, I think that kind of clears up the, well, I hope it clears up some of the questions around sole trader and limited company, because I know uh, a lot of people are asking, you know, if you're going to go with limited, at what point should you go over to limited company? So if you're earning, say, what's the threshold? Is it 25, is it 30, is it 40,000? Some have been told that, uh, you know, unless you're earning over 50,000, there's no point in going limited company. So what would be the ideal threshold to move over to limited from sole trader? So for us, we say um, it's literally beneficial right from the start because the 40,000 or 50,000 that you'll find people writing online, it's not to do with local pharmacists, it's to do with um, other type of self-employed people. So for example, if you've got an Amazon or an eBay business and you're working from home, your, your expenses won't be that great. So that, uh, that, that type of employment uh, job, you know, you'll, you'll find up to 40, 45,000 pounds, you'd still be fine because you're not going to make that much saving being a limited company because You've got no meal uh, expenses because you're literally working from home. You've got no mileage you could really claim because you're working from home. So it wouldn't work out. But as a sole trader, you couldn't claim them either. You can't claim meals or, or mileage because you're basically working for yourself. So you can't ask HMRC that I want to claim expenses from myself. So you're not able to claim them because you're, you're classed as an interim worker. But as a limited company, which is a separate entity from yourself, you would then be allowed to claim mileage and meal allowance, which is um, the big factors that allow the tax to be half of what it would be as a sole trader. Um, so what we find is people at the beginning, when they do first phone up, the reason why they're debating should we be a sole trader or a limited is purely financial because there's a cost difference uh, to be a sole trader. The accountancy fee is um, half the amount of what it'd be for a limited company. So they, they tend to want to be a sole trader, but you know, we, we say to them that you're going to earn at least £40,000 in a year, you know, because even on, on average, a local earning at the moment, three to three fifty, and, and many are earning a lot more than that at the moment, but, but typically £300 a day is what a local is looking to earn. And you'd only need 100 days to be earning £30,000. And, and and obviously a local will work more than more than a third of the year. So um, even at... Uh, at thirty thousand pounds, the difference between sole trader and uh, being a limited company saving in tax after factoring in uh, the accountancy fee, you still save three thousand pounds in tax, even at thirty thousand pounds. And obviously, if a, a locum is earning thirty thousand pounds a year, probably not worth locuming. You could earn more being employed in the, at that point. So the, the the 
always earn more than that as long as they choose to do it full time. And um, so with limited companies, the more you earn, the better it is, the more you'll save because you'll have more expenses. So you can earn a lot more and you get to keep a lot of it. Whereas as a sole trader, you kind of, we definitely wouldn't recommend you going over the 18,000 pound threshold because um, at that point, we can justify our fee. We know that uh, we'll still save you more in tax, even at 18,000 uh, as a limited company than you would as a sole trader. But it, it, what the first 18,000 then couldn't be claimed through your limited company is only from at the point you make your limited company. And it's why we just say, make it right from the start. You know, we don't charge you a fee for 60 days. And if in that 60 days, you can't come up with the fee money and, you, you know, if you've not made at least, we'd say £8,000, £7,000, £8,000 in those 60 days, which obviously um, our, our fee is six five nine. You know, if you can't come with a fee in that time, then then obviously you don't need to continue signing up. There won't be anything to pay. Um, I think we've got another question. Um, if you're working full-time elsewhere but want to low and part-time, is it best to go a sole trader or a limited it would depend how many days you're doing, but more than likely, if you are full time somewhere else, so it would be sole trader because uh, one of the things we're able to do as a limited company that you can't do as a sole trader is employ yourself. As a sole trader, you you can't put yourself on payroll. You can as a limited company. So the salary is set at seven three two a month, which is just below the secondary national insurance threshold. So you're able to remove just under nine thousand pounds from your company to your personal account without you having to pay any personal tax or national insurance. But at the same time, it's an expense for the company. Your salary is an expense to the company that reduces the corporation by about £1,700. So, um, but without having that payroll, that saving couldn't be there. So if you were working for somebody else, even if it was part-time working for Boots, probably would work out still better just to be sole trader, even though you wouldn't, uh, end up paying more tax, obviously, as a sole trader. It gets to the point where it's just uh, difficult for us to justify our fee because then the, the saving plus our fee may equal to what it would have just been as a sole trader anyway. So uh, it still comes down to how many days. Like if you're working for Boots and you're working two days a week, then then you know we'd still look at the numbers and give you the honest answer of what will work out better. But if you're working five days, six days employed, and you're just doing one day a week. Uh, you know, two, three days a month or something. No, definitely, it's, you'd be better off being a sole trader. Yes, I, th I think it's a lot to do with how much you work, what your contract is with uh, you, with your employer. Yeah. You know, like, like I said, if you're working one or two days or three days a week, then work out how many more days you're likely to log them uh, on the side and then see, I mean, it's, I, th I think it's, it's a co quite a complicated case. So, Depending on the individual circumstances, uh, you'll probably get an answer. So, yeah, best is I think if you give him a call tomorrow or anytime next week uh, and get a more detailed answer uh, based on your own circumstances, that would be probably easier. Yeah, we'd be uh, happy to answer it like case by case. Cool. And we have uh, and the question about IR35. Now that's a bit more complex. So, uh, the IR35 is um, I think Imran can explain a bit more about that. But we just I just want to say. Uh, a few things about the IR35. Most of the locums don't fall within IR35, um, and vast majority of the multiples have come out and said uh, they will treat their uh, locums outside IR35, apart from, I believe, Boots, uh, Asda, and Superdrug. Now, they've gone for a triple lock system, which is uh, slightly different. Now they're not saying that they're directly not deal not dealing with IR35. All they're saying is they're not going to pay into your uh, limited company accounts, which in a way bypasses the IR35 issue. Um, now they're claiming it's to do with money laundering. Take that with a pinch of salt, uh, because none of the other companies see money laundering as an issue. Um, so one of my advices would be that if you're if you've got the option of working for other companies who are keeping it nice and simple and paying you straight as a limited, as a locum into your company, make them your first choice for work um, and see if Asda, Boots and Superdrug decide to change their stance on IR35 um, and then make a decision based on that. But I would certainly recommend keeping things simple, going for companies who are going to treat you as a outside IR35 um, and working with them first uh but Imran will 
tell you a bit more detail about what IR35 is? So IR35 has been around for a long time. And um, it's basically HMRC trying to capture the people who are genuinely our employees, but they're using their limited company to uh, seem like they're, they're, they're not an employee. So if you remove the limited company away from the person, does that person become a natural employee? So initially this was started off for IT contractors, which I agree, majority of them were classed as employees, but they were using their limited company to, to you know, uh, benefit themselves in terms of reduced amount of tax. And the companies had a benefit where they didn't have to, you know, pay maternity, paternity pay, sick pay, holiday pay. So it worked out for both of them, but ultimately HMRC was losing out on revenue. So that's who they went after first was the IT contractors, which, which is uh, which, fair enough because uh, a lot of these IT contractors have um, one contract which lasts multiple years for the same company. So they could be working at Dell, Microsoft for two, three, four, five years at a time. So they literally go to the same place. They've got their own desk. They've, they've provided a laptop, a, a mouse, a chair. They've provided all this equipment by the employer. And if that contract went, they may not get another contract. So they li literally, the, there's no point in that limited company. So that person literally is a an employee and they just, uh, you know, hiding behind the, the limited company to reduce the tax. Locums uh, traditionally do not fall under this. You, you know, lo locums will have two, three, four, five different clients um, at a time, if, if they can't work for one, they'll be working for another. So they, they, the main thing is a limited, uh, a locums company is a genuine company. It's not there to uh, help, um, to just reduce their tax. It, it does serve a purpose. So this this uh, should have never really got as far as it has when it comes to locums. Like the only people HMRC was genuinely trying to, to capture in this were those locums who, just refuse to work for anybody else. So they'll find one pharmacy and they'll just work for that one local pharmacy. They're not willing to travel. And if that pharmacy doesn't need them for that day, they won't look for anywhere else and they just won't work. So they're, they're happy to work one day a week if that's all it is, but they won't really go anywhere else. So without a limited company, you know, they are just an employee. So that's the kind of uh, locum HMRC was after. And, and realistically, what is that? 5% of maybe locums, less maybe, you know, majority of locums are out there trying to negotiate the best rates, the work for whoever's going to offer them the best rate on the day uh, and, um, and they're willing to travel um, up and down the country to, to get the best rate they can. So, you know, um, the, the, the argument that for a locum to fall under IRP is very difficult. Um, you know, they're, they're not uh, obliged to work for any one employer. Uh, at the last moment, the employer can... Uh, message them or, or phone them and say, oh, sorry, you've been double booked by the agency or, or by the pharmacy manager. We no longer need you for the day. It's one of those no hard feelings. You just have to either, if you can get another shift for the day, you will. If you can't, you won't be working that day. You know, that, that's that's obviously not the behavior of an employer-employee situation. That, that wouldn't be allowed. And vice versa, the other way around, if you have an issue and you no longer can turn up that day to, to work, you, you're just going to send a message or a call to say, I, I can't come, you'll have to find somebody else. You know, these are the behaviours of, of, of a locum. So, um, you know, it, it never should have got as far as it has. And it's, uh, and it's you know, uh, Boots uh, and um, Roland and if, uh, the pharmacies have come out and said, yeah, our workers are not under IR35 and, and they're allowing everyone to just work as, as they wanted to. It's just a shame that Lloyds and Asda decided we don't want to deal with the headache of IR35 because their concern was just covering themselves that if there ever is um, a, a one of their empl employees is found to be inside IR35, then it would be Asda who would be paying the fine or Lloyd's paying the fine rather than the person themselves. So because it seems like they didn't want to deal with that, they've decided to do this anti-money laundering thing where they're saying they'll only pay you into your personal account, which is basically forcing you to become a sole trader, which is incorrect which HMRC have already said that um, if you were employing a locum before IR35, then you have to um, analyze them on, a, on an individual basis. You couldn't uh, bypass the IR35, which um, ASDA and Lloyds have managed to somehow do. Um, yeah, I think that's something that we've kind of picked up on our last meeting with Gorilla as well. Um, so, I mean, if you like, this is quite a complex topic and we could probably spend another hour just discussing the IR35, uh, but just got a few questions from the accountancy side. 
Uh, so I want to clarify that whether the threshold is 18,000 just to justify a limited company. It, it is. Uh, that's how we've worked it out. That it, for footballs, at least, obviously, if there's a, an accountancy company out there that's charging double, triple of what we charge, then of course that threshold would be different. But, but for us personally, that's that's where we we feel that what what we're charging plus what the tax would be for a limited company would be still less than what you pay as a sole trader. But you still make a significant saving. Okay. Um, and Joseph, if you want to have any more specific questions, you can speak to Imran. I'll leave his details uh on the on our website and also on our telegram network mm -hmm. or you can just message me for it and i'll send you the details as well um if you're working full-time then yes it's best to go for a limited company um and i've been registered in a company since 2006 and that was to be honest i think that was the best decision i've ever made um how can you claim for meals your account will explain that to you when you submit your expenses um Hanin is asking, should you talk to an accountant before starting uh, to do locum work? I would say yes, absolutely, absolutely, because then you're fully ready. As soon as you're as soon as you're ready to work, you've got your everything in place, uh, your financials in place, your account bank accounts in place, and you're ready to go. Um, so yeah, because you one. do want to, you want every uh, first pound that you make, you do want it to come through your business account. You do want to claim right from the start. It's not worth waiting until you've made eighteen thousand pounds to then pay 20% tax on the first 18 and then start making the saving. You know, if you're going to do it full time, you'll hit 18 very fast, but then it will be too late at that point to be claiming expenses for those first 18,000. So you won't be able to claim the mileage you did to make, earn that 18,000 or the meal allowance. Now you won't be on the payroll either. So for those months, you won't be able to claim the 72 salary either. So anyone that's looking to do it full time should really form the company right from the start. Okay. Um, and also, some was asking whether uh, Lloyd's, Asda, and Superdrug uh, will pay into sole trader accounts. Um, I think my understanding from what they've, re uh, what they've said is that they'll pay into sole trader accounts and personal accounts. Uh, but one of the questions I think we've got quite frequently was, um, if someone pays into the sole trader account, sorry, into a personal account, say uh, Lloyd's or Asda want to pay into the personal account, if they transfer that money back into the business account, can they then claim that as a uh, business income? No, they can't. Because it's clearly the transaction has been, like Lloyds and Asda would be able to say, we paid you into your personal account, so we treated you as a sole trader. You can't then retrospectively turn yourself into a business because that's not what the transaction was. So no, you wouldn't be able to claim it. Now, I'd just like to add in, though, that... Um, all independent stores, any pharmacy that's got less than 50 employees, they are exempt from IR35. So there's plenty of pharmacies out there um, that, that you're able to work for, plus some of the multiple that are, allow it as well. Um, so there is like a big, a large scope for, for work out there that doesn't involve IR35. And, and IR35 hasn't actually been the issue that people thought it was going to be. It's just um, Lloyds and Asda have just decided to go a whole different route with it. Uh, but even then, still at the moment, people are not checking that box, so they're still getting paid into their business account, and they're just not checking the box on Denlock to say that this is going to be a personal account and the money still is at the moment going into their business account. So hopefully, as long as pressure is still applied to Lloyds and Asda, there's still hope that they will change their mind because ultimately they do know that this is not an IR35 issue. Locum wouldn't really come under IR35, and they, they didn't really need to make this uh, whole thing about uh, money laundering. And they should just really uh, back down from that and just go back to how it was. Yeah, that I couldn't fear because we we have we did speak to uh, a corporate lawyer and contract lawyers as well, um, and they looked into the whole local contract, the IR thirty five issues, and they've all said it doesn't. I mean, it's a pretty smart way to avoid IR thirty five uh, and dealing with IR thirty five. But a basic way at the same time. Yeah, yeah, uh, but it doesn't still resolve anything i mean i think uh, yeah, yeah. there was other companies uh, in different industries that have tried the similar move and ultimately what it happened was a lot of the farms a lot of the uh, the good employees or good uh, locums decided to avoid those companies and they lost uh, it made it more difficult for them to hire and it, they've lost some of the best minds so it i don't see how it benefits lloyds and super drug and as the, to make it more difficult for locums to work for them, especially when they claim there's not enough pharmacists for them to hire and they're having difficult recruiting. So this is just 
them making it more even more difficult for themselves. Um, like I said, you know, you can you as a local, you're free to choose who you want to work for. Um, there is plenty of shifts in other for other companies and all the independents, which is like half the market anyway. They, you know, they, they don't follow it in IR35, um, and you can work for them as a limited company. So I think that's I think that covers where we're way past our time. Uh, that covers the accountancy side. Um, we had a few questions that we wanted to go through later later on. Um, so I think we, one of the questions was prison pharmacy like, and can you please expand uh, one for Anisha? All right. So um, prison pharmacy is kind of like a mix between community and hospital. So you are presented uh, scripts for chronic conditions and the patients are just having like kind of repeat medications, repeat reviews. But at the same time, you are looking at it, you're checking their bloods, you're checking their like their regime are they on a ta tapering dose are they titrating their medication has the hospital had any input or has their GP had any input and you're kind of merging the care together you are predominantly kept in the healthcare center and you need to remember when a patient is a prisoner healthcare is their secondary reason for being there so I used to always call the prisoners patients and just kind of struggle between differentiating it but they are, it's sad, but healthcare isn't their primary concern. Um, and you won't have many acute cases. If a patient is very acutely unwell, they are most likely to call an ambulance and transport them into hospitals. So you are there to just manage long-term conditions. But also I found it a great opportunity to start honing in on addiction and kind of treating cases of addiction and reducing uh, medication dependency and stuff like that. Um, just a bit about getting into hospital and prison locuming. I didn't kind of talk you through the process, but the it's very easy and it sounds daunting because you sound it sounds like you're jumping in, you're going to go see patients in their beds and all this stuff. You always get an induction. It's not like community pharmacy where it's like you get chucked in in the deep end and you're there, go go go, and you're like the responsible person, account like accountable to everyone in hospital and prison and everywhere. You've got a giant team and you will have an induction nine out of 10 times unless you've worked there before. So they will call you in. You have like all your training. You will do logs to make sure that you meet the standards. If you don't meet the standards, they will just give you extra logs and give you training. And you will have someone to report to at the end of the day. And it, they kind of ease you in like with like over a few weeks. And it's really easy. Um, and then from that, from that point, from the point that you're ready that's when they kind of take off the trading wheels and you're ready to go but you still have a network of people around you nurses doctors pharmacists techs dispensers hcas everyone to kind of help you with any decisions that you need to make anything you need to do and if you get a query that you don't know how to deal with you can just walk off think about it research it contact the medicines information department um yeah it's really easy and once you get into it and you get into the swing of things it's really easy it's like second nature it's like breathing um what other questions did we have we have uh, how can we get into locum work at hospital i've seen community locums work um i've only seen community locum work uh, many thanks and which agencies are good for locuming in community and in hospital now i can answer the community one uh, we do actually have a list uh we do we, we're in the pharmacy review uh surveys and we get regular feedback of locums and we do have a list of the top 10 locum agencies uh if you look on our twitter feed uh it will be on there there's also pharmacy review twitter feed what i'll do is i'll post a link to pharmacy review twitter feed on telegram uh, on the pharmacy lounge on telegram so if you follow that uh, follow that page um you get all the regular updates and we're actually developing a separate full social network called circle um, where we'll have pharmacy review integrated. So whenever you go for a shift or you look for a pharmacy, you'll see the rating of that branch um, and you'll see which agencies are good to work for, what the ratings are, what the feedbacks are. We collect a lot of data um, on the pharmacy market. So that will all be available hopefully over the next few months. Uh, but but that all, all that requires locums to give feedbacks regularly so we can take the, the latest data. Uh, so yeah, uh, which how can you work in in at a hospital um, and which agency so, are you good? 
in hospital, prison, and those kinds of institutions, um, you have to sign up to an agency. I believe TBC work alongside Medwing, and we have some hospital shifts, mainly private hospitals. But um, I can give you, if you just get in touch with me uh, through Telegram, just DM me or send me a message on Twitter, I can get you in contact with my local agency or give you a list of my top three locum agencies, which have competitive rates, listen to what you need, and are very, they kind of work off what you want rather than you doing what they want. So just feel free to get in contact, but um, I can also talk you through what is required, what paperwork is required, and how to go about it so it works out best for you. Cool. Um, but yeah, you can't go through, you can't go independently, it has to be through an agency. Yeah, I think that's the only thing with the hospital and, uh, and prison. Uh, like Medwing has actually, is actually one of the number one rated agency on our network so far. Uh, they are very good. And we worked with them on the uh, COVID vaccination project. Um, uh, that's one I would highly recommend. Um, and we do advertise a lot of their jobs on our network. Uh, but in terms of other agencies, uh, like I said, it depends uh, on where you are, uh, which part of the country you're in. Uh, different agencies cover different uh, geographical locations as well. So it varies a lot. Um, but uh, I would probably say like it's just try quite a few and see what's the best one that works for you. Um, and I'd recommend, when you, sorry, when you start sorry, signing up, when you start signing up, it's a very lengthy process. There's a lot of paperwork at the start. So I'd recommend sign up for multiple agencies in one go rather than just tying yourself to one and then in a week's time or a month's time joining more agencies because there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of time goes into it so just do it all in one go get it out of the way and then you can just start pitching them against each other with rates okay. um, and also think about the, uh, this is a kind of a common question that we get what's acceptable salary for a non-manager community locum pharmacist now that really uh, that varies uh, on um on a lot of things uh you know how many hours uh, a week you're contracted, how busy is the branch, how many staff do they have, um, what are they expecting of you uh, as a, as a uh, non-pharmacist manager or even a uh, manager. So the, it, normally what I would say, if you're taking on an employed position, uh, the rule of thumb is £1,000 per hour. So if you're on a 40-hour contract, you'd be expecting at least £40,000 per year. Um, and if it's... Um, if it's a very busy branch or you have to travel quite a lot, then you'd want to go up further until uh, it's at a rate where you're both happy. Um, so I would say, like I said, thousand pound per contracted hour uh, would be a minimum, at least for me. Um, and anything less, I don't think would be worth it, even if it's a quiet branch, because I know I can work in busier branches and get more money. Uh, ultimately, once you're at work, you know, you're either doing, you're going to be working anyway. So you might as well maximize on how much you can earn on the day. Um, and one of the things that you'll notice once you start locuming as well is, especially when you go direct or even through agencies, uh, that they will try and knock you down. They'll say you're newly qualified, you don't, you know, you don't have enough experience, um, or that the companies are going to pay you that much. They'll try a lot of different ways to knock you down uh, and get you to accept lower rate. Look at what, speak to farm the locums on our network uh, in in your region look at the debt market data, see what's been achieved in the past, uh, what the companies normally pay and go off that figure. Uh, and don't always believe what the agencies and coordinators will tell you. Uh, that's probably the best advice I can give you when, you're coming to, when it comes to low-coming uh, and negotiating. Just in there, Toril, sorry. Um, something that's very important um, from a legal perspective and especially on, on the groups. When you're talking about locum rates, you must not discuss anything in the future. To do so might be classed as anti-competition or anti-competitive, and it could land yourself and the network in very serious trouble with competition and markets authority, because it could be classed as rate fixing or rate setting. So it's always best to ask on the networks, if you're unsure, what has been achieved in the past for a particular day or a particular holiday uh, on this particular year. So say, for example, Eid's just around the corner. I could go onto the network and say, um, what's everybody charging next week? And that would be classed as anti-competitive. What I could say, however, is 
What has been achieved last year for Eid? You're then talking about pass rates, and that cannot be classed as anti-competitive behaviour. So you need to be very careful. And we, as in I use the royal we here, even though I'm not a TPC admin or um, a pay, play a part in TPC in relation to uh, the directors, etc. We're very hot on clamping down on individuals who talk about future rates because it could land the network in a lot of trouble and it could land you also in a lot of trouble with the competition. You've just got to be very careful. Um, yeah, and we we have had letters from the CMA about talking for talking about race um, earlier on when we first started the co-op. Um, and again, I can't emphasize it enough of what Paul said. Don't ask about future rates. And one of the reasons why we set up Farmers to Review was to give locums the insight into the market data so you can understand what was achieved in the past. And based off that and the data from the information from other locums in the region, you can figure out what to charge. And normally when I work with um, Medwing and when we post rate jobs for Medwing, I advise them on what the best rate uh, at what rate they should be advertising the job. So a lot of times when I will advertise a job through Medwing, or for Medwing, sorry, um, we'll try and get the best rates that we can. Uh, but then there is still always room to maneuver and always room, uh, you should always be asking, can I get more? Um, and then it's ultimately it's it's between the two parties and what you're both happy to work for. Because like I said, the rate isn't the only factor. It's how busy is that branch? Do they have the supporting staff? Are the employers good to work for? Um, so there's a lot of fact. And again, how much traveling do you have to do? Because you have to take the thing that that's also the, the moment you start driving to work, that's working time. So if you're working somewhere that's um, an hour's drive, you're not really starting work at nine o'clock. You start working at eight o'clock when you leave your home. And then you get there for nine o'clock and then you come back at seven o'clock. If they finish, if they finish at six, then you come back home at seven. So your actual working hours is from eight till seven, not nine till six. And these are things you have to factor in when you're negotiating a rate, when you're looking at traveling uh, 50 miles, 100 miles, 150 miles away for work. You need to take this into fact that if you have to stay in a hotel, you need to factor that in the food uh, hotel, uh, breakfast and lunch and dinner, everything else. So those are the things that you really need to factor in as well. Uh, on of, sorry, on top of that, uh, what Paul said in terms of discussing future rates. So say I had a shift booked for 9 p.m. today. I shouldn't discuss the rate I'm going to be getting until, say, that 9 p.m. shift starts or ends, because that, again, is discussing future rates and can land you in hot water. Yeah. Um, we still have a lot of questions. So, and we're we're supposed to finish at nine. We're actually finishing in three minutes the Zoom meeting. So, what I'll do is um, I'll upload this video. Uh, so, hopefully, that will. If anyone wants to go through everything that we've said, you can see it again. Uh, and I'll also leave everyone's um, Twitter handles and email addresses, uh, like Post Centre especially. Uh, Imran will be available tomorrow to answer any questions. So, you can get you can reach him on Telegram as well. Uh, and I'll leave his Telegram handle. So, uh, but for any other questions, I said join our Telegram network and we're all on there. Uh, we can pretty much, us and, and another 10,000 pharmacists. So we can answer all your questions on there as well. Uh, but for tonight, I want to thank everyone, uh, Paul, Mohammed, Seja, Imran, and Anisha for coming onto the panel. Uh, and I want to thank everyone that joined us today as well. Um, so I'm still getting questions on there. Right, I'm going to have to call it a night and then hopefully tomorrow uh, or later today you can ask us the questions. Okay, Ray? Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Would it be worth if we just make a video ourselves answering the rest of the questions or just do it on Telegram? There, there is a lot of questions on there. Um, a lot of questions. So, like I said, uh, everyone can answer those questions on, ask those questions on Telegram and we can go through them. Yeah. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.